So now we have Netzilla. Um, they're going to tell us how to catch uh, a red teamer. Um, so uh, hopefully some, some good advice for everyone in the room. We, we've got Andrew Davis, who's a, uh, a director at Netzilla, and uh, John uh, Medvenix, who is lead incident manager. Uh, over to you, gents. Thank you. Right, thank you. So today it's going to be a not too in-depth technical talk, but it's more around to do with the setup of red team in and that when you rush, you do make silly mistakes and these mistakes may get you caught. Uh, it's suitable for both red teamers, blue teamers, management and salespeople. And these are some of the topics we'll go through today. All right, quick question just so we've got an idea about you guys. Put your hand up if you think you work in red team. Brilliant. OK, where are the blue teamers at? There's got to be more. All right, another All right. little tip. <laughs> you look to your left and your right. If anyone's gone pink or red, they're probably featured in this slide deck. So I'm Andy Davis. I've been a pen tester for over 20 years. I've seen the industry change. Um, names and categories have changed. It's sort of the normal pen testing has now become more VA and compliance. And what used to be pen testing is now suddenly become red teaming. So sometimes I get a little bit confused and I may interchange terms, but uh, I've been around the block quite a bit and I'm sure two thirds of the room already know me. So I'm John Medvenich. <clears throat> I was introduced with Netzilla, but that's actually my guys. I'm a lead incident responder for the Houses of Parliament. So I'm representing the blue team on this side. I've worked with Andy a lot. We've known each other for a while. Uh, we like to share war stories and bounce ideas off one another. As a blue teamer, I get a hell of a lot of good information from pen testers and red teamers. <laughs> and it's a lot of the, the most useful stuff that I get is sometimes outside of the reports that they give, where you're just sitting down and saying, well, I was playing with one of the tools that you were playing with. I couldn't get it to work and finding out how that works and some of the easy ways of being able to replicate that in the ways that I catch things has helped us, leaps, has helped us come on leaps and bounds. So as I said, um, you might notice that gets jumpy at the name Bears. If you're looking at the news recently, there's a very good reason for that. So as I said earlier, this isn't your typical red versus blue talk and hopefully it'll be some, a lot of fun. <laughs> so who here out of the red teamers and pen testers test from their own home IP or their own corporate IP range? Be honest. There's at least one hand at the back, I can see it. <laughs> why, why is this bad? As a blue teamer, if the IP enters any log files, they're just going to do a simple who is. And with the right who is question, you can get a company name. And we know a lot of you uh, buy blocks of IPs, and you may have different blocks and subnets, and we're just going to block the whole load. So from a, definitely from a blue team of perspective, and you'll see this as a theme throughout these slides, OSINT is where we start with. OSINT is usually the cheap and quick, effective way of being able to get, gather some intel. And if you're using your pen test company IP address, if you're using your personal IP address, first off, if it's a red team assessment, and we aren't aware of this, or at least the operational team isn't aware of it, the first people they'll go to are the ones who coordinate stuff like red team exercises. So you'll easily be caught out or be flagged by some people who will go, ah, OK, you caught them at the first hurdle, maybe let them continue. Another thing, though, especially from a blue team side, is that what I've seen is when red teamers try to use a corporate IT, uh, IP space, some of the blue teamers, the defenders, the companies that you might be doing the engagements for, may have already whitelisted blocks of your IP because you're already doing tests for them. You'll have other testers using that range. So if you're now piggybacking off of that, is that fair? Yeah, you can argue that, all right, that's still a vulnerability someone can exploit, but that's still a bit of a, bit of a dick move. <laughs> so have you heard of a firewall? Because uh, as we mentioned earlier, Competent blue team, they're just going to firewall your entire corporate range. And if you're doing a big red team over several weeks or months, that's just going to look silly in the report. Also worth noting is, as with cloud accounts and domain fronting, which we may touch on later, depending on time, if you have multiple cloud accounts, AWS will, or Google will get onto the facts very quickly that you've got multiple accounts. And you may get banned. So it's not just your corporate account, but also your personal account. 
or your business account and your business website may go down. Moving on to domains. So what's normally important with uh, fishing and waterholing, we like to go out there and choose a domain that's quite similar. We've got typo squatting, we might use something more generic and use the company name as a sub host name. And expired domains is normally a challenging topic because we find in these days more blue teams are monitoring for expired domains. So as soon as you've bought it or you've won it off the auction, the relevant team is alerted straight away and it's normally quite useless. So one thing um, you really want to be careful of, and if you're transitioning, say, from pen test to red team, you've got a good idea of what, how a red team should enact or you want to try and really replicate an actual actor, then you have to understand the legalities of these domains that you're buying and especially how you're going to be using them. So from a blue team perspective, if an engagement starts and you're now using a domain that is purposefully built to mimic a third party or one of our own domains, then that can get very trickle, tricky from a, le a legal perspective. You may find yourself having to try and uh, talk your way out of why you aren't in breach of these. So it's definitely something to consider. And this is just a general purpose for any, anyone's trying to set up a red team or anyone trying to commission a red team. Just make sure that whatever's within scope is going to be covered from any of these legal acts. Also, you've got to be careful how you're paying for these domains because some of the blue teams have links to law enforcement and other credit checking histories and they can get your personal details. And this might happen. <clears throat> so setting up uh, email servers. How many of us have uh, been sort of told by salespeople or management, you've got one day set up a mail server, you've got fishing tomorrow? Yeah, at least three, four. Okay. And again, common theme, why is this bad? Don't forget to scrub your mail headers. So if you've rushed the mail server, you've probably not thought about the IP trail. So if you're using cloud forwarders, it may, again, have your original IP address in the headers. Also, what we've seen out there in the world is a lot of companies or maybe wannabe hackers, they're not changing the default host name. And it's quite easy just to have a, a mail filter rule that says if the host name is www.example.com, don't forward on. Under, uh, it, one bit of advice that I definitely want to give out to all of the red teamers on this side is that if phishing is going to be part or is going to be your initial stage of your assessment, understand what's within a, a header and understand what could catch you out. Understand mail routing, for example. So there are environments out there, I'll just pick one at random, um, something like Digital Oceans, where it's very cheap and very easy to set up a mail server. If that's part of your relay, then there'll be some companies out there that will flag that as being, as well, a lower reputational score, and that might alert. So just be careful and try and send yourself at least some emails so you understand what the headers look like and, as, and think with a blue team hat on, how would I catch this out? Another issue is how do you know if your fish is successful? And I always personally like to have a catch-all email address because sometimes people reply, is this a fish? So if you've got that response coming back, you know you've been successful and at least you get into the organization and you don't need to panic and think about retail in your attack. So again, know, knowing your tools, knowing how your mail servers works, you can put in different rules to filter out your home IP address. This is one such example for Postfix that I use in my own implementation. Feel free to write it down, take a picture, copy it. But different mail server technologies will have different rules. Please research the tools you're using. Again, if your IP address leaks in the, the mail headers, you might end up going to a jail or having a knock on your door. Okay, so how many people in here are aware of uh, SEM fresh blacklists? Spa okay, so it's spam eating monkey. If you're gonna be setting up something like this and you have the very short time in, in which to do so, you've gotta be aware that the, things like these blacklists feed into reputational scores for lots of security technologies out there. What these do is these look for new domains or new sending email, uh, email sending domains, and if they have been registered within certain time periods, within the past five days, the past 10 days, then they're given reputational scores based on that. 
So this is no longer trying to get around a blue team, this is trying to get around the technologies that a lot of companies are implementing, whether it be email gateways like uh, Symantec or um, Mimecast, that are automatically gonna filter this stuff out. But there are open source tools to allow you to check against this uh, to see whether or not you're gonna be part of these lists. And again, to help with the spam scores, think about setting up SPF, DKIM, and DMARC records. If you don't understand them, please just take that away and Google them. And this is where we start to use blue team technologies against them to benefit our red team. So who here uses automated tools to set up a water and hole or fishing web server? Are there any common tools? Anyone? Feel free to shout out. Okay, that's more efficient, but we mean more behind the website before it. Something like Social Engineer Toolkit or HT Track. Mm -hmm. We've also got other platforms like Beef and Empire. And as we're going through these slides, we'll touch on a few other things like SSL and domain categorization. Cool. So, from a blue team perspective, some of the things, and this is going to be a common theme across a lot of these tools that we're going to talk about now, is understanding some of the things that are the artifacts that are left over from using it, but also understand some of the default settings that you are completely able to change, but from a pen test point of view, you may not need to. In a red team, you definitely have to. So one example here is HT track. If you're gonna be cloning a website, you need to understand that when you clone a page, it's gonna put a header and footer on those pages, saying that it's been cloned with this tool. And it's gonna say where that was cloned from. From a blue team, uh, as a blue team perspective, this is brilliant because now I've just been given a massive red flag and I've also been told where it's from. This is an easy win. So if you want to allow the blue team to win, carry on. If you want to make it more tricky, understand what some of the artifacts are. All right, well, beef, again, the same thing, default. Some of, the ca some of the things that people will easily pick up from a blue team side are hook.js. If you, if you use beef, if you know beef, you'll understand that the default name is hook.js and that, that is gonna be picked up very, very quickly if it's in conjunction with any other alert. But have a look at the session keys as well. The, the default session key for uh, beef is beef session. If you don't change that, that's another artifact that's gonna say exactly how and when something has happened. So it's again, just understanding your tools and understanding to change defaults. And, and honestly, from a blue team of perspective, I like saying this because I've read through so many pen test reports that say default creds on this or default settings on this. So now I get to give this back to the red team and say, you guys can be just as susceptible if you're trying to rush. So Empire, I won't go into the details. If you want to know more, please hit up my blog where I've actually caught some red teamers actively doing this. But again, the set URLs, if you're not changing the defaults, you're going to set off alerts, you're going to get caught. Cool. So... Domain categorization. So we've gone through talking about email, we've gone through talking about being able to at least clone a website or some of the different tools for cloning websites, but how many red teamers feel comfortable with what domain categorization means now? So old school way that everybody in this room I expect understands is that we can categorize a domain. I say we. There are third parties out there, there are tools out there that does it for us. But you can categorize it by the top level domain or potentially the host. It will be able to distinguish the difference between a web server and an FTP server. But because a lot of people like using domain categorization straight out of the box, a lot of these companies that do it have put in a lot of time and investment and been able to build it out and try and, uh, to try and narrow it down to specific site, uh, parts of the website <coughs> compared to others. So some of the ones, the directory and file name, they'll now be categorized differently. If you're trying to reuse, for example, the domain that you used on a previous um, on a previous engagement, if it was categorized fine as, say, shopping, but you've now uploaded uh, an Empire listener to it, or you've uploaded a malicious uh, PHP script, that could potentially be categorized differently than the rest of the website. And then going on from that, query strings. Your query strings can also give you away. The common query strings with a lot of tools, if they're gonna be seen on a phishing website, they'll know that those query strings mean something in the context of, say, Meterpreter or any other, uh, like social engineering, then they will be categorized differently. And a lot of companies are now starting to do this automatically. So again, you're not now against the blue team, you're against all the tools that they've invested in, and, it and you need to take time to understand what their capabilities are. So as John touched on, 
There's a lot of vendors out there that do blue teaming, filtering, and domain categorization. These are some of them. There's a tool from MDSEC called Chameleon that tries to automate the process, but I've never been very successful using that tool, and I've always done things manually by myself. With the blue team, it's normally an automated process, but a blue team that can actively go to these sites and change the categorization if you're detected. So what we can do in advance is we can visit these sites and just say, hey, my phishing site's e-commerce, or it's banking. And it's a bit of a gamble, but it may just be what you need to slip through the blue coat or some other filtering device that's maybe blocking your payloads getting into the customer's network. <coughs> Again, with uh, SSL, there's no excuses these days. You've got lots of free providers. Let's Encrypt is a really popular one, and I think they're getting more and more free SSL certs every day. I've seen one red team in particular, they paid for the sign-in on their binary, but then they forgot to do it on the C2 channel. So then they leak in usernames and passwords in the clear over to the cloud. With GDPR coming into effect, if you're doing this on a live corporate network and exposing more than 6,000 records, you could be part of a GDPR case. So take care. So we touched on this briefly. Uh, we're not going to hang around on these slides too much, but Again, some of the things that you definitely need to understand that are different from a pen test is if you're now using, say, personal cards or, co or corporate cards to buy infrastructure to do this sort of thing, then understanding that you have channels to restrict that information going elsewhere is vital. So what I mean by that is if, for example, there is a good relationship with a client and a cloud provider and you're trying to use their infrastructure to attack them, then they will be the ones who will be party to the information who's purchased those devices, whether it be virtual servers or channels like VPNs, if they're able to then link those two together, and if this now goes above and beyond, you may find yourself in very, very gray, murky waters, and I'm talking from a legal perspective. Also, that's a very good way of getting your credit cards blacklisted and getting them flagged. So if you've got a good friend and you can use their credit card, do that. <laughs> but be wary of credit card fraud. <laughs> also, it's important to think of links. So you need some form of control or you need to write into the proposal of the red team how you're going to manage the engagement. How is the customer going to react? Is there some kind of way that it can filter before it gets too far and before authorities are involved? Again, otherwise you get these people knocking on your door and you may need to pay for a new door and your credit card won't work. So moving on to command and control. So first we'll look at what we've already covered. Try not to use your own IP space. And if you are going to host in the cloud, just be aware of the cloud provider's policies. If you get caught, it could be a world of pain. But then without the right ISP and connectivity, how are you going to do your job in the first place? So always make sure that the teams are aware and that you can prove that you've got these contracts in place and that you're allowed to move forward. Otherwise, it's just going to be a legal mess. Also, think about the tools that you use. In the default state, the AV companies and blue teamers, they've already gone through them. They've made numerous signatures. You're just going to get caught before you've even started. So do your research, know your tools. And since GDPR is coming in, please, please use SSL. It's now free. It's easy. There's no excuses. Moving on internally, these are some of the mistakes, and we've got a slide at the end where we'll cover a few more. But we know all pen testers like Cali. If you're going to do that, please change your host name. Otherwise, as soon as you plug into the network, you're just setting off flags within DHCP logs. We've seen it happen. Honestly, we have seen it happen. It also, just makes us smile every time. Also, if you split the team into two and you've got a remote team and a team on site, make sure the team on site doesn't send emails back to the office. Because again, as a blue teamer, they're probably monitoring or they're <laughs> going to think, why is xyz.com just got emailed? I think we've got a pen test going on or worse. Also, another funny one is don't start brute forcing accounts on day one. It's just too noisy. I've seen a few people do it. I don't know why. Just wait until the end. And funny story is if you're given static IP addresses, stick to them. Don't go stealing IP addresses of employees because as a blue teamer, they're going to think it's the employee that's doing the malicious action, 
and that employee's probably going to go into a world of pain that's unnecessary. So, payloads. And this is, anyone shout out, what do all of these have in common? Think from a blue team of perspective. What could we all look for in these? Yeah? Yeah. Do they have additional data? Signatures. Metadata. Metadata. All of them have metadata. And that, from a blue team perspective, is a quick win. If you don't, don't understand the attachments you're using and the metadata that could be a, that, that's going to be there, from a blue team perspective, we're just going to slurp all that up, and that will be our threat intel. And that will be just freebies that you've given to us. So as red teamers, understand the attachments you're using, but also take a gander at some of the free and open source tools out there to look at metadata. Understand how to scrub it. Understand what good metadata looks like and bad metadata. Understand the little clues that you're giving away. Understand how that could be used to fingerprint your attachments, especially if you're trying to use a level of entropy, but you've got metadata that's static. So take a gander. Um, yeah, these are some of the tools and some of the good places to look for, especially if you want to understand how some of the metadata is catching you out, or how some of the automated tools and technologies that Blue Team has invest in is catching you out. So one of the ways I got caught was, I was recently told on a red team, yeah, we've just seen you try to fish with the dock, it's been filtered, the Blue Team are not aware. Little hint, move to PDF. Because I didn't have a lot of time, I just thought I'd take a screenshot, I'll uh, cut and paste it, turn it into a PDF. <coughs> I forgot to scrub it. I'd left artifacts such as my directory structure, my laptop name, my user account name, and the time and date it was generated. So then when it sub subsequently went through the next round of filtering, it was flagged straight away as spam. Silly mistake. So moving on to pay payloads reversing. Since our Industry's matured, we've kind of split and diversified into Pacific teams, red and blue. And I think we should share more common skill base. The red team needs more blue team skills, and equally, the blue need more red for understanding. We need to understand the platforms that we each use and share. And hopefully, this will make us all improve in the future. GCHQ released this good tool called CyberChef. It's uh, mainly based in uh, Node and JavaScript, and it's very good to help de-obfuscate in macro payloads or any obfuscated hex code. If I've got an embedded MSF, Metasploit payload, this is where I normally start off to decode it until I get the hex, and then I'll probably move on to an online decompiler to try and help further the understanding of what's going on. Metasploit, for those that don't know what it is, it's a powerful exploit development tool. But over the years, different red teamers, pen testers, and security researchers, they've bolted on lots of different modules from OSINT all the way up to exploits. It's worth going away and having a quick Google if you've never heard of it before. So this is my slide. <laughs> So from an empire perspective, empires, I've seen a lot more people move towards that, and this is where the blue team can feel really good, because empire, because it's quite new and it's got a lot of features, pen testers and red teamers are jumping on it. A lot of adversaries are also using it as well. But again, there's default strings in empire. If you understand how it, how it works, so the listeners and stages, the different file types, they have static flags when they call PowerShell. And I've taken, I've taken a look internally in a lot of different places and not been able to find other PowerShell-based tools that have the same flags being immediately set and called. So if you've got endpoint monitoring, so if you've employed things like Carbon Black or Tanium or uh, any of the other tools out there, you can identify when PowerShell is being called either through CMD or through PowerShell itself or WScript, and you can find these flags. And if, that, if you hit those flags, that's a quick, simple win. Um, if you don't, haven't invested in the endpoint monitoring, then again, PowerShell logging. PowerShell logging has I'm not going to go into all the different types and all the different ways to get it set up, but if you, if you have PowerShell in your environment, if you haven't locked it down, then you should definitely be looking at what it's doing because tools like Empire are purely PowerShell-based. And if you've got the login, you can easily pick out these two strings. So yeah, I definitely recommend you either take a picture of this or if you've got Empire set up at home, just have a gander in the info files. It's right there. From a red team perspective, though, and I shouldn't be telling you this, but I definitely am, 
Understand PowerShell ways of obfusc obfuscation. Take a gander at what sort of characters PowerShell will absolutely ignore. There are certain characters out there that it will just skip over. You can just insert those at random in there and suddenly you're gonna get away from a static string being the one that to catch you out. So there are different ways of looking at the same problem. Right. So again, with Metasploit and Empire, they typically, when it comes down to the shell level, it's gonna be a Metasploit type of payload and these are some common strings that are easily identified by automated technologies. So as John mentioned, think about your tools, think about obfuscating it in a custom way. A lot of organizations out there that are capped on budgets, uh, some devs have come up with some pretty innovative scripts to help them do automation. And they're using various platforms to aid them in initial discovery. ClamAV is an open source antivirus. And in this example, we've shown that it is quite trivial to fingerprint specific Metasploit payloads. This can reduce the incident response time from minutes or hours down to about 20 seconds. So what happens when the blue team identifies you? <laughs> All right, so I'll tell you these, this section. So from a blue team perspective, um, what happens when you've identified it? We've only got a handful of blue teamers in the room, but can anyone guess what most blue teamers end up doing? Especially the junior ones. It was touched on in the Mandian talk. Two words. Ignore it. No. <laughs> virus to, total. It'll go to virus total in some fashion. Someone somewhere will upload it. And if it's not the blue team that does it, it'll be someone who's received the phishing email who may be really clued up on security. They'll upload it because they'll want to know what's going off. Understand what virus total does with that sample once it's gone. Because that is going to be key to what's going to catch you out later. Um, they'll definitely share it with others. They'll share it with all the AV providers. And when you suddenly find that you're now part of a blog post on a specific criminal type of malware because you've tried to emulate it, then now you, find, now you can easily link back to how that got out. So authorities may be scrambled to your location, and again, you might be interviewed by these two characters or someone a bit comic, less comically than them. So also, the red team do make silly mistakes, and for those that watch my LinkedIn and social media, you would have seen that I identified something yesterday. But red teamers test their payloads by uploading them to VirusTotal. And again, it's a reuse of the same slides. VirusTotal will share it out, and you're burned before you've even re really started. What you need to do is set up your own custom environments, your own AVs, firewall them off, make sure they don't dial home, which is very hard these days, or this link here is quite useful. Are they trustworthy? I'm not sure, but they've never, or to my knowledge that I can see from other people hitting my website or trying to knock on my door, they've never shared any of my payloads. <coughs> Another important factor is, once your payload succeeded and you've got a shell on the box, there's multiple different operating systems and different services and shells are represented in different ways. Here we've just got a small selection of Windows, Linux, and a database shell. What you don't want to do is start typing OS commands in a database shell or on a mainframe because you're either going to risk crashing something or sending off alerts again. And also you're going to look unprofessional. So always do a bit of research before you start blindly hammering commands into the little black box that jumps on your screen. At this point, by the way, I'd, I'd like to point out that if, if that does start happening, then it's no longer just the blue team you're going against, you've got the sysadmins who are also going to be asking questions. First off, they'll want to be able to point the finger at the intern who's using the wrong commands on the server, but once they've found out that it's not them, it'll go straight to security. So reporting, we all love this job. Sometimes it can be, be a bit of a drag, and with red teaming, it takes a lot longer than a pen test report. The obvious questions are, what is your evidence? Have you got the proper date time on your evidence, in your time logs? Because you're gonna get challenged. Stuff may be patched straight away or after the engagement, and if you're invited back to retest because someone didn't believe you, it could be a very awkward conversation. 
With red teaming, reporting again is slightly different. There seems to be more focus on people, processes, and technology. And the recommendations are less technical, but more tactical and strategical. So when I've received reports from red teamers, and I've been part of a blue team and we're doing a wash up session, one thing that I wish happened more was that I want the red team to really challenge the blue team on exactly what did you see and when and how. A lot of blue teamers, because they're the ones who are having to pay for this whole test, usually feel that they can sit back and receive a report and don't give as much back to the red team, which I know can be just as frustrating for the red team as it can be for the management who just really want to get their act together and do the same sort of reporting. So if you're part of a company or if you are an internal red team and you are doing this sort of thing, you are completely within your rights to ask for more information from the blue team to improve your game and also to improve theirs. Because if they aren't able to answer the questions, then how are they going to answer those questions if a C-level person asks them? And also, because you're typically dealing with C-level and the boards, they're not used to the common te terminologies that we use in our everyday pen test reports. They may not understand script kiddy, leak hexer, or some other funny comments I've seen. So you need to try and change the tone to your audience. And this is where a lot of pen testers seem to fall down on. So it makes sense if you've got someone in your organization that's good with dealing with businesses or business managers, involve them in the reporting to make sure you get the tone and the language right. Otherwise, your report can be laughed out of the boardroom. Mm -hmm. Another two factors are everyone loves to see pretty diagrams. If you don't know about the cyber kill chain or the diamond model, go research them. They're very useful tools. This has been pushed across all the boardrooms and they, they like diagrams. They typically then understand a lot better. So what's wrong with this picture? Anyone feel free? How am I going to find? Huh? Well, you've got to Obviously, clear your text password file for starters, but um, where is it on the network? If I'm a blue teamer and I want to go find this file, how am I going to do it? No idea. Exactly. Always use full paths, and we see this mistake time and time again. Everyone's doing it. I'm guilty of it. Hopefully not anymore, but make sure <laughs> full paths are documented. As I said, you might be invited back for retest in two weeks. It may be a different team because of conflicting schedules. Make things easier for the retest. And here are some personal cheat sheets on how to tailor your command prompts. Different tools have the prompt formatted in different ways. And at the end of the test, you might get a phone call or an email. Oh, what happened on Tuesday the 12th? How are you going to search through all your log files? It's a big task. So if you can change your prompts, into a set format, it makes it very, very easy to grep on a Linux system or in PowerShell. This is the same for Metasploit, how to change the prompt. And also, you've got the spool command, which will then record all your Metasploit session to a plain text file. Lastly, who wants a nice quick tip on red teaming? Of course you do, that's why you're here. One person, right, we'll see you later. <laughs> Everyone else, we're not going to show the next slide. Who wants a quick tip? Come on. Yes. Yeah, that's oh, better. There we go. Everyone that I've seen in the last six months seems to be repeating plays from this book. Simple fact. Maybe people are doing things differently, but everything I've been called in to oversee, every play has come from this book. So if you haven't read it, Mm -hmm. Shameless plug, but I've, I'm not the author. I have nothing to do with it, but it's <laughs> worth knowing. So Andy told me about this book, and I went and read it quite a few months ago. And he's absolutely right insofar as that there are a number of different scenarios that this author runs through, and people have replicated those time and time again, especially because a lot of what he's talking about is getting around things like automated systems, AV, IDS, trying to tailor things to the engagement that you're on. And unfortunately, a lot of red teamers have just taken this and copy-pasted, which makes it easy from a blue team perspective, but the good ideas are there. And it's not a very big book either. I've been reading it on the train. <laughs> the author also has a very small .NET, simple SSH program, so it's easy to load SSH into the customer's network rather than relying on the common tools like Putty that may raise a flag. Okay, so, so I think we've got some time, extra time, so uh, the next slide. 
Hopefully we'll get some laughs. Hopefully not only cries, but if you see anyone running out of the room, please stop them. Personally, I hate this slide, because this is basically, it is giving you some really terrible ideas that you should not do under any circumstances. This is being recorded. I'm saying this, and this is definitely for legal teams. Don't try this at home, Don't please. try it. Don't, do not try it. But we have seen people try it. So there was an interesting report about a month ago when a client goes, oh, well, yeah, we caught them. But for some reason, we had the NSA on our network. Well, no, they didn't. It's just a very clever red team, and they changed their MAC address to have the vendor ID of the NSA. It's publicly available. Nice little tr trick. The red team had a few giggles. You can also use the Hack5 Pineapple. Its MAC address is elite, and it's quite funny seeing people scramble. If everything in your network suddenly starts changing to be a pineapple, loads of questions get asked, really. Uh, the next one really gets me, because obviously as a blue teamer, I, there is always the little animosity between red and blue, but when red really start going for you, that can be annoying, where we've had like, our, our analyst constantly having to change his password again and again and again, and all of his files keep moving and changing. Uh, it's and also, nice. if I'm the red team and I catch you doing that to me on site, I will go after your workstation, I will shadow it, and I'll just make a simple record as you're changing the passwords, and you'll be pulling your hair out and thinking, I've just kicked him out, why is he back in? I'm probably just ghosting your terminal session. <clears throat> so the, the fifth one, when we were talking about doing this slide and we were putting these together, I really didn't want him to put this in, because it's very simple, very quick change, but it would absolutely bring anyone to a crippling stop, because as soon as all of your users are now a domain admin, they're not want to going to give that up. <laughs> um, we're going to skip over some others, but the last one is the insert filter DLL. So this is another trick I've seen with some pen testers. But um, the example that's out there in the wild, it's typically sending, whenever someone does a password change, it's sending it clear text over the network, or depending on your defense technologies, it could be going to the cloud. Again, if you're doing that in plain text, very, very bad. So I think that's, that's it for what we've got. Hopefully you've managed to learn a few things, whether you're red or blue. Um, if you've got any questions, we've, we're happy to take them here. If you don't have questions now, but think of them later, you'll definitely find us in the bar. And a message we're trying to drive home is, always have a blue team guy on your red team and a red team guy on your blue team. We've got different skills. We need to cross-share more. We all used to be one team in the past. Why can't we be one team in the future? And then there's a couple of things I just want to pick up on quickly from that before we do. We have got a bit of time for, for questions, so, so do, do, do stay with us, Sandra and John. Um, the, the, the point you made about um, don't change all users to domain admin, I think, firstly, yes, they, they won't want to give it back, but I think more importantly, um, if, as we often say, companies have to assume compromise and there's bad guys in there, you've just let the bad guys into everything, right? So don't do that. Um, and don't mess about with the CEO's account. I can't stress that more. Kind of coming back to what... Um, Chris was saying this morning, um, it's not a game. It's fun, but it's not a game. Um, anyone got any questions? I thought that was really good. Thank you. Um, that light is very bright in my eyes, so I can't see. So, Adriana, <laughs> can you, uh, any questions? One there. Hi, I'm, I'm very interested in skills development in InfoSec and Cyber. You guys are obviously at the top of your game. How, how do you uh, grow people as quickly as we need to, to be as good as you? So personally, I've been in the game for many years, and I've got a big, massive library of books at home. I've also tried to move it personally into digital format, media wiki, that's quite easy to store within a VM or in Docker. And also, I've built numerous machines over the year. I've got a private ESX server. I've got boxes in the cloud. I've got a private playground. So from my side, because um, we get a lot of churn within, say, SOX, so you get loads of junior analysts come through who only have a baseline knowledge. They want to develop that. They instantly find something that they really, have, they really want to do, and then they go for it, and then they're out of the SOC again. So you do have that constant churn. One thing I've found that really helps is mentoring. Mentoring is one of the things that we really, really push strongly uh, in everywhere that I've tried to work, and it's paid dividends, honestly. When you've got more senior people who are now guiding and showing other people how to do things, and basically giving them the little anecdotes that we've given today, like, this is where I've seen someone really mess up, that those things will stick a lot more, well, in my experience, than just reading it in a textbook. 
Um, so a lot of the stuff I've learned from Andy because he deals with a lot of things that I don't. And conversely, I deal with a lot of things that Andy doesn't, and we pass it back and forth, and we're both better off for it. So I didn't know about domain categorization until I spoke to John. And he goes, hey, why didn't you do this? And it's like, I never knew, never heard of it before. So it's, you need to converse back and forth. And also, the industry has changed over the last 20 years. It seems to be more open. You've got lots of online platforms, like Immersive Labs upstairs. You've got Hack the Box. It's very easy for teenagers to get access to the material and, and self-learn. Thanks very much. Some great ideas. Cheers. There's a question open. right behind you, Adriana. Right behind you. Uh, just a question for Blue Team. Um, how do you go about dissecting the, uh, the obfuscated payloads? For example, the partial empire one, right? So like, I, I noticed like .e hyphen e and c, the encrypt encoded part of it, gets picked up by a lot of AVs, right? ATP yeah. as well. Uh, but you can easily change that, right? So for example, uh, partial has set variable and get variable, right? So you can do a set variable L and assign the value E. So now your E becomes L, right? And then you can change that so on and so forth. Yep. So how would you detect something like that? So from time is always of the essence. And the easiest thing that we will use is enclosed sandboxes. So if you're trying to, um, if you're trying to have an encoded or obfuscated payload, run on something, then there will always be an end result. If I can try and get that to work in an enclosed environment, then I don't need to know exactly what's on the inside, I just need to know what its first steps are gonna be once it's run, and I'll look for that instead. Um, when it comes to trying to filter it out at a gateway level, then again, it would have to be as much static information as I could pull. If I've only got the one sample to work with, then it may just be a Hail Mary play. If I've got multiple, I'll look for signatures that could be used across all of them, even from a network perspective. So now if I'm gonna be using, say, bro rules or snort rules to try and pick it up, rather than pick up the file, pick up the, tra the actual traffic, where it's coming from and how, maybe it, be, it might be bit rates, it might be where it's coming from, like geographically, I'll use anything to try and slow it down or stop it. Right on. And have you seen payloads which are encrypted and wouldn't decrypt unless they are a certain condition is satisfied? Yeah. Right, like Demi guys, right? SGA <laughs> doesn't decrypt unless you provide it resolves the internal host name or something, right? Oh no, definitely. Which I've wouldn't seen, happen in case of a sandbox environment, right? Oh, so in, in, I've seen those plenty of times. I've seen it to its own detriment as well. So I've slowly transitioned to a more move left role recently. So I'm doing red teaming, blue teaming, overseeing pen testing, and from one particular vendor that comes in, they have this very innovative idea. They use the domain name. So it's going off, getting the domain name, and if the domain name was the key that was embedded in the program, it decrypt and run. Right. Uh, unfortunately, what they didn't know, two weeks before, we changed our domain structure and we had different domain names. <coughs> so uh, the payloads then didn't work. Thank you. No worries. So we've got time for one more question, if anyone's, anyone's got one. Shout if you do. I can't see that section in the middle. The sides I can see fine. Um, no, in which case... Um, Andrew, John, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We, we do have a few minutes now for the, uh, the, the, the stream changeover. Um, up next, we have uh, Sarah Harrit. I hope I pronounced that right, from Spirant. Um, in the meantime, thank you to our sponsors. <laughs>